Hello and welcome to the Delphian podcast. Delphian is an artist-led nomadic gallery focusing on emerging and early career artists. Each episode will feature a different art world practitioner, from artists and gallerists to collectors and curators. If you liked today's episode, please like, share and subscribe. Hello and welcome to the Delphian Podcast. I'm Benjamin Murphy and I'm joined as ever by the other half of Delphian Gallery, Nick Jess Thompson. Hello. And Rosalind Davis. Hi. How are you doing? Thank you for having us. My pleasure. So the first thing we kind of wanted to discuss was your various roles as an artist, as a curator, as a writer, as a teacher, and how they cross-pollinate and inform each other and how important it is maybe to to be a curator as well as being an artist what what curating can inform in your creation practice Mm -hmm. um i think being a curator is really important to me as an artist i mean in terms of what i enjoy about curating um it's the similar thread of what i enjoy in art making which is you know, learning and collaborating with people, uh, having a sort of an experience of art in another way. And it allows, um, I mean, I curated a lot of, I think it's 30 shows now. I'm coming up to my 30th show that I've curated. And, you know, that has been a real variety of curatorial kind of challenges um, that have been really informative and exciting but I also you know part of what I initially did as many people do is I curated shows that I was in with my peers and I had a context and I thought that was really important um it was really empowering I think Mm. you know as an artist you're often sort of waiting to be picked is often the thing or hoping somebody's going to notice you and I was curious to sort of put myself in context and have a themed show with artists of similar narratives and I really enjoyed the process and so it became more and more I mean I was curating within an arts organisation shows that were open calls like you guys do, as well as theme shows and so on. So I was kind of learning all these different remits, like curating an open call is a really different kind of challenge to curating a theme show or yeah. solo show. Um, <clears throat> and so I, 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 I love the kind of putting together of a puzzle in, is how I see it. Um, and just over two and a half years ago, I got the job as curator at Collier Bristow Gallery and... Um, that has three shows a year and again they're 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 themed narratives and then also there's a one open call sort of within sort of every 18 months but yeah it was it was it was that part of and i'm not in those ones all of <laughs> i'm not in a group of the gallery one it's a slightly different context and it would look a bit weird uh, but i will be doing independent projects where i'm still working with a group of artists later next year at art house one so um i i love the process I, it's really good for artists to see how it is on the other end of things of what it's like to organize yeah. a show yeah um it makes you a better artist i think <laughs> absolutely yeah <laughs> you're like oh i will remember to do that <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um yeah so it, it's it's all of those things i mean i love the meeting the artists and talking to them about their work as well and it's great if they're actually a bit in tune with the fact that i'm an artist and then it's more, more you know that they can be curious about that too and mm. you know that i'm doing shows and we become as you know it's Curating is also about, you know, creating a, creating a community amongst all these artists for me as well. So, you know, now I've got, you know, an amazing community, really. I find that um, us at Delphine Gallery are also all practising artists mm-hmm. as well. I find that through curating, it teaches me more about my own work and the way I approach kind of my own shows than just sitting in my studio and making the work. And um, so I think you learn more about yourself as an artist through curation and I think I'd imagine the same is true if you're a curator and then you start producing work what do you think is the is the importance of kind of artists creating their own opportunities and Mm -hmm. instead of just waiting around for things to happen starting a collective or curating their own shows or I think it's super important super duper important I mean I've I've run two artist led organizations you know that had a you know the gallery exhibition program element but it was also educational um and it was really important to create the opportunity because it wasn't there 
basically. Mm. And because it's about saying, well, I've got a good idea. I think I know how I can run an arts organisation. I've learnt from my career as an artist of what works, what doesn't work. I've learnt about marketing. I've learnt about, you know, promotion, publicity, social media. And running those arts organisations really gave me another helping hand in sort of developing skills and really figuring out how it works. You know, again, it sort of comes back to like sitting around and waiting for opportunities um, can make you feel very uh, lost or isolated. And I think it's great if you've got some um, something that you're doing yourself. It gives you a different kind of um, feeling, I think. Mm. You probably recognise it. It's a different feeling to sort of being have something to say that's not just about it's about my work it's, it's nice to have another project that you're mm. like passionate mm. about that you can talk about um and it gives you like a it, it changes the dynamic sometimes as well with people how they view you as an artist if you're doing another project it's something else to talk about and there could be other kind of crossovers or fluidity within that i mean it's something that i do a lot of mentoring and teaching and I always encourage people to do their do their own opportunities and whether that's just doing a peer crit group or getting together three months with artists that they don't know or mm -hmm. doing something like that you know and I'm part of some of those things too so you know I've sort of nurtured a few artists to set up their own opportunities and now I'm sort of working with them in the capacity of gallery and artists you know which is really it's a really like lovely circular thing that they've seen that yes, they can do it too, and they can find a space, they can put on a programme, they can do it well. You know, so it's it's really important. So I was, I was wondering how important you think art theory is mm -hmm. to a contemporary artist. I think a lot of artists, especially ones that have gone down the art school route, are kind of completely put off art theory and then just decide just not to engage with it. And I think some people think it's just it gets stuffy and it kind of clouds the work because mm. people kind of over-contextualise and whatever. So I was wondering what, what you think about that and how important it is for a contemporary artist to be knowledgeable about art theory and art history. I think it's sort of both things that you said. It can get overly intellectual and it can get really boring to read. <laughs> um, and I think it, but also it's, there is a need for it. I think it's just, it really depends on the kind of work you're making as well. Like, I think it's really important for people to know about contemporary artists that aren't, you know, super famous artists that they're going around and they're reading about people's practices because if we're all just still talking about, you know, an art theory of, you know, just modernism, a lot of my work has that element of it being in the legacy of the work, but it's not important for me to kind of keep saying, going on and on about modernism, if you see what I mean. I know what it is in context to myself and others. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think it's important, I think it's important to read and look, but I think it's more important to look, um, well maybe not more, but just sort of similar, you know, similar values, like knowing your context, knowing your territory, but I work with, you know, the kind of curating thing comes back, back into that, that I'm working with artists across many different kind of art theories and modes and movements and things that tap into their work and, um, and so I learned through those elements of curating and I sort of, it's sort of a theoretical education I'm getting all the time because each artist has their own agenda, identity, background and stuff. So that is part of going back to that learning and being a curator and being an artist. Um, you know, I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's really important to, to engage with it on some level, but I don't think it's everything. I think it's quite different in our... 21st century society where we're drawing on other things that are mm. impacting upon us that may even just be like social media and that's not about an art theory but it's about we're being affected by different things now within an art context and it's not just about well you know we're the cubists and mm. and I'm quite magpie like in that sense of I enjoy kind of looking at lots of different elements and you know and, and also I think there's also a different thing of wanting to be engaging with a non-art world yeah. Our mm. audience world. So if I start banging on about modernism to you know your Joe Public or you know, Collier Bristow Gallery is a gallery within a law firm that has a very varied audience. So you have to kind of be aware of that in your mind, of who you're talking to, or what you're writing for. Obviously, if you're writing for Art Review, it's different. Mm. But it can waffle on. I mean, there's a brilliant writer, Martin Herbert. Um, and I love his writing, and I always like reading his books and articles because he's 
he talks about art in an accessible way, but in a poetic way, actually, in an in insightful way. So looking up. <laughs> Do you think art, maybe because of social media, is become less elitist, or at least it's moving that way? Mm -hmm. I definitely. I think it's, I mean, I've been working with a number of artists, as sort of say, through teaching, and um, I really see the difference. I mean, it's made a huge difference to me in terms of reaching different audiences. I think it's helped with um, building pe people's confidence to become collectors, because something like Instagram can really encourage a sort of fan base. I mean, we know both know Oliap, who has mm. a huge fan base for his work. He doesn't need a gallery necessarily, although it's great to work with galleries. But he, he can kind of um, direct the conversation and, and sell his work. And I think that's really, again, empowering and a really healthy thing because there aren't many galleries um, around. And it's good to take some independence from being dependent on a gallery for an income stream, um, which is problematic, as you both know. <laughs> do, you, do, you think, do you think galleries have less power or not necessarily less power? They have less of a monopoly over what work gets shown and which arts make it and which don't? Uh, I would hope so. <laughs> I mean, I think there's so many different kinds of galleries and what you're talking about there is like a kind of blue chip gallery like, you know, Gagosian, Victoria Miro. And that's a different kind of art market in it itself. And I think there's a whole different set of strasses and rules. Um, you know, my partner, he shows with um, gallery, like kind of big galleries like that um, and medium sized. And there's different rafts and I think, you know, there's a lot of politics when you get to the higher end in terms of what you can do. So I think what's really good is that um, artists can take can take control of their own careers and decide on what they where they want to show a little bit more. I mean, that there are other opportunities that come through social media. That there are, you know, galleries that are able to kind of emerge that can be supported by those things. I mean, I think my personal opinion is the kind of the balance of the. The, gallery, the commercial gallery I'm talking about, not artist-led or places where I'm curating, which is privately funded, which doesn't have that kind of financial agenda, um, that they have a different uh, relationship. And I find it, you know, that the whole thing of being an artist and having a transactional relationship with a gallery, a little bit tricky, um, which is not to criticise anyone that's with a commercial gallery. You know, it's purely about you're entering in a different kind of relationship, whereas when I work with artist-led spaces, the work can be for sale, whatever it is, but it's 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 about the nurturing of ideas, maybe, in some, you know, again, this is a sweeping generalisation. I've seen some really great examples of galleries really working with artists to sort of push their work or, you know, support it in financially and so on. Um, but, yeah, I think it, it it's good if all well, the power is not with the galleries. We have some of our own power as artists to say yes or no, or this is good or this is not good. And, you know, we've all heard of stories where galleries have exploited artists and that's not going to necessarily mm. change but the more we mm. talk about it the, the better it will be so social media also helps with that yeah now it seems that um because of social media maybe that um sales are maybe no longer kind of the measure of success and like say back in the day there, there were artists who sold very few works mm -hmm. like van gogh and they wouldn't they wouldn't be thought of as successful artists until hundreds of years later whereas mm -hmm. now artists can maybe not even make works that are saleable mm -hmm. and how they're measured how people are measured as being successful has completely changed yeah i think successful is a very subjective word i think it's um is it more subjective now than it used to be yeah maybe maybe i think the thing is is again you're sort of dealing with what does the external art world say about success they see it in financial values that's how people judge where have you got in your career how much money you're making and anyone that's not in the art world will ask you and yeah people in the art world if you have an exhibition did you sell anything mm. yeah you know, it's the first thing my parents will ask yeah. you ever sold anything and that's not what i measure success as you know that is a wonderful bonus if you happen to sell something i am making installations that are not particularly sellable mm. i've still worked with commercial galleries and things like that but the success for me is how successful, and I think if you speak to a lot of artists as well, that you know, there's a great artist that we did an interview for um, called Richard Galpin in, in my book, and he talks about the success of the work. Is the work successful for him? You know, and within a peer context, and you know, has 
he achieved his ideas and success for me is never a financial one it's always about um did I push this as far as I could um am I curious am I happy with the work how has it been received and I think it sort of again it leads into sort of having an exhibition is that did it sell is like the last thing you really want to ask yourself because if you're sort of putting success on the measure of financial you know um imperatives you know then you are undermining in a way your own work because I think you have to look at an exhibition as you know was this an opportunity to learn or teach or inspire or make new contacts or collaborate with people and that way then you're fulfilled and I think for me having graduated you know 12 years ago from the Royal College of Art it's though you come to realise those sort of philosophies are more and more important that it's not about the emptiness of somebody giving you some money mm. you know and I've sold work you know it's not they never have but you know, then that's great. That's always a bonus, you know, and I think success in where it's just about the money, um, you can just be pumping out work. And I luckily don't have that kind of pressure. I get money from other jobs and sometimes I sell work, you know, I sold some work to Soho House, two works through social media. Mm. And that's wonderful. But, you know, you never <coughs> know it's going to happen or what, you know, where those opportunities might arise. So, you know, I think it's, it's how successful was the idea. I find it hard to not be slightly disheartened when, a, say, a particular show doesn't sell as yeah. well as my last one or, or whatever. I think that's inevitable. I think it's so up and down, though. And I've known artists that have shown in very, very big galleries that you'd think, oh, yeah, they sell out the show, and then they don't, or they don't mm. sell anything. You know, and I, it can be, I think, but it's just trying to think to go beyond that. Where If you can, you know, where possible, it's, you know... I've been out for a little while longer than you, so maybe I can be, you know, I don't you yeah. know, I don't mean to sound that in a funny way, but because when earlier on in my career I was showing in a sort of carousel of different, you know, with a commercial gallery and um, and it was, you know, it's tricky and it's tricky. You're undoubtedly going to feel, you know, down if you don't sell stuff at a show, but the more and more I'm doing shows of my own, I'm more and more moving away from anything that's going to commercially sell. You know, um, and I find that quite satisfying, <laughs> mm. um, you know, because I'm getting to work ambitiously and I'm not getting somebody saying, but can you make that a bit smaller or could you have some sparkly thread in there or, mm -hmm. you know, which sometimes can be a pressure to make something you're not entirely happy with. Like when I've done, I've done a few commissions in the past or, and I always felt really tricky about it, you know, my integrity felt a bit, uh, <laughs> I'm yeah. not sure how I feel about this. Yeah. This doesn't feel very pure. <laughs> yeah, there are not. I mean, and it works for different people in different ways. Obviously, you know, it's it's up to each individual person, really. You know, I always, as well with Colleen Bristow, think we'll sell certain things, and and then I'm really surprised when we don't. And you know, it's just the way it goes. You know, right gallery, wrong art. You know, right gallery, right audience, or the right person at the right time is often the thing. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it can be totally serendipitous, can't it? It can be. Like... I mean, of course, you control some of that because of social media and putting it out there. But yeah, it is sometimes. Mm. You know, people haven't been able to see your show, and then you know all the rest of that. Yeah, life stuff gets in the way. <laughs> <laughs> what would you give to uh, as advice to a, a newly graduated arts student to like to a first piece of advice when they first? becoming a, an artist in the real world? I think um, create your own opportunities, really. I mean, I think do your research. I did a lot of research before I left Royal College of Art and um, it meant I kind of had a career as an artist, i.e. shows and sold work from the beginning. Um, whereas waiting around and sort of thinking, well, so somebody's going to pick me, find me, or the rest of it, I was mm -hmm. kind of really aware that that wasn't how my life was going to be. And, my father was an artist, so I kind of knew that it had bumps in the road, you know, mm. and how actually can you protect yourself from those things. And I think um, the research part is really important, building the relationships, going out and networking, which, you know, some people don't like the word. Just think about it as an amazing conversation that you might have with somebody because you say hi or what do you think of this work? And building those relationships are super important because they will see you through, you know, the people that you work with, the artists that you work with that are really lovely to work with or you've had an exhibition with, like stay in touch, support each other. Those relationships will 
like help support you you know again with like say even collectors make sure you know who they are if possible if you're able to find out if you're selling through a gallery they won't tell you but I know all of my collectors apart from a couple and so you know they're your ambassadors like take care of everyone around you take care of the curators that show you or the galleries that show you the spaces I think you know the one the word also that goes with that is saying thank you you know and I'm as a curator working with hundreds of artists and you all have had no doubt an experience where you think you know that it shouldn't be a transaction it should be about um, nurturing of one another and mm. supporting of one another and it's not just about the show that you've given that person that one time you want them to come back so over time you know again when you need to remind people you exist because we're always working with so many artists and some people have become real friends you know because mm. they really are supportive and I know that they'll come and they'll support my shows as well as the curatorial projects and the importance of saying thank you and turning up it really is the most important thing you can do really be nice be kind you know it's um be supportive of one another and I spend a lot of my time time going around and trying to support artists you know that have been on our shows as well as looking at other artists so you know it's great when people actually turn up again for things that they aren't even exhibiting in mm -hmm. and maintain a relationship because We'll go on and we'll do other things, but also we'll also get other people say, do you know any artists that you can recommend? And you remember the ones that are nice and kind, so thank mm. you and turn up at your stuff, not just at their own things. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So, yeah. And I suppose social media helps with that now because yes. it's, it's a different avenue and a completely different online conversation that you can you can start with people away from exhibitions and stuff. It's a whole different thing. Yeah. It's, it's a super good way to keep in touch as well for things that you can't get to or see how I like... I'm sure as we all do, we all tap in to see how our artists are doing and other projects and if we can't mm. get there then you can see it. Um, it's made it much more fluid um, and again sort of super empowering that you can kind of direct some of the conversations or you know keep in touch. I, I, I'm sure you're inundated with by emails such as I am. I really much prefer to just be like how so and so <laughs> yeah. and uh, have a look on, on how they're doing and, and also then post stuff and support them you know so that's a kind of continuous thing you know artists past present and future you know it was what we're always what I am always trying to post about on social media. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a team of one at the moment. So. <laughs> well, you found some new collaborators today already. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's wonderful. How um how much of one's success do you think anyone can truly claim have claim to kind of be the the author of themselves? So how much of of someone's success is do they owe to say serendipity or being in the right place at the right time or getting given a leg up? I think mm. a lot of people aren't don't want to acknowledge the fact that they didn't get there on their own. Mm. Do you think? Um, well, I think a, a lot of people are kind of wary of acknowledging the fact that they've been helped out a lot by people mm. and they've been um, supported by people and sometimes they've been in the right place at the right time and spoke to the right person and yeah, and they've, they've been included in shows maybe because of that. Or... I don't think it's ever like purely serendipitous you know the cell thing that's a different thing of somebody coming in and loving your work but I think um in terms of I think everyone every artist success is down to a number of factors and that's also to do with the artist themselves and how engaged they are with the process I mean I think it would be really regrettable for people not to acknowledge the people that had helped their careers along the way but I think I've noticed maybe a lot of people ne don't necessarily do that though is what I mean Mm, kind of they don't acknowledge point. yeah or, or they're kind of reticent to because maybe they think it diminishes what they think they've put into it themselves I think I think that would be a really not great move in terms of your <laughs> career <laughs> I mean you know I've been present in people's careers as an artist and you know um, and helped support them to get the next thing and the next thing and I guess um as we all do, that's what we're trying to do. It's not just show an artist, we're trying to help them get to another place where they might meet another artist. Um, I mean, most of the, the good artists that I know are aware of the people that helped them. It's a tricky one. I mean, I think, it, yeah, as I say, I think it's shooting yourself in the foot. Like, we all have a journey where there's been many people on that journey and 
sure, you might not remember to thank every one of them. Like, we don't get award ceremonies, so <laughs> apart from the set of rights. So, um, you know, it's kind of hard to say this. it was down to this person. You would hope people would, artists would. But, um, you know, there are artists out there that are very ruthless and will just be about themselves. And mm. they're generally the ones to steer away, <laughs> away from, in my opinion, because there's no good in, that comes of those things because you don't work alone as an artist or a gallerist or a curator. You always have a team, you know, and I have a team that helped me at Quali Bristow when we have the shows and I always thank them publicly, you know, and my partner is an artist and he's, I acknowledge him very publicly in lots of different kinds of collaborations that we've had, you know, whereas other people might pretend they did it all mm. themselves, but I guess that's the difference in mm. personality and ego maybe. I suppose the reason why I asked and the reason why it, the, the idea is in my mind is because I gave a, a guest lecture at the Slade a few months ago and when I was writing it, I thought back to all of the similar things that I'd been mm. to and seen and I realised that mo- most of them were just someone stood up there for an hour just bragging about all the great stuff they'd done. Oh, yeah. So I, looked, <laughs> so I looked at it in the, in the kind of, in a sideways way and I tried to explain how certain opportunities yeah. came about. Yes, I did exactly the same thing. Yeah, but I just, I suppose... Um... No, I know, but the, I set up a Zeitgeist starts project and before that, called Gallery, and we had artists come and give talks and we were really um, stressed to them that it wasn't about just hearing the success story, it was about mm. hearing how they got to where they came mm. from, who helped them in a way, what were the things that didn't work, what did they judge as success, what did, you know, and, and that was really important because you can hear somebody going on and on about how great their career is and they, they sort of went from A to B you know I just did this and they did this and then I won like the Turner Prize and I'm really successful that's mm. not the interesting story mm. you know and it's not helpful to anyone it's not yeah. and so you know when I give lectures I'm really like okay I want to explain from how I went from A to B to C so I did an open call and then I was in touch with the judges of that open call and sent them a nice email or I wrote to this collector and I sent them a nice letter and then they offered me a solo show but it was about those like personal human touches and mm. people forget that, you know, you work with 24 artists in a show from time to time and, you know, how many of them write back and say, not just thank you, but thank you, that was a really amazing experience, really mm. value everything that you did. Um, and those things, as I say, said before, they do come back and pay you back in lots of ways. But I think it's really important to say, because I remember those talks and thinking, well, but how did they yeah. get from A to C? to D, you know, and it was the case of this curator helped me or I worked with a curator for sort of two or three years sort of earlier on in my career and we helped each other, we collaborated on projects, I brought the artists, I wrote a lot of the text and she would help facilitate it and curate it a bit and we worked together for three years and then we went our separate ways to, she went ended up, you know, she wanted the experience to work in a commercial gallery and she has that now which is great but she's always in my PowerPoint, I was Irina Stark yeah. and he now works um uh, Pilacorius, you know, is doing really well there, and I'm like happy for that lady, you know, that mm. she, that we were mm. able to help each other on our path, and you know, that's not necessarily that that person stays in your life forever, you know, and keeps, you know, you just your relationships change, but mm. it's important to acknowledge people for sure, you know, that gallery that helped you out, you know, when you had your first show, the people you worked with, yeah. Mm. So maybe. Can you tell us a little bit about um, Collier Bristow Gallery and mm-hmm. what it's like running a, a gallery in a, in a functional space mm-hmm. and with a, with a company like a law firm? Well, um, Collier Bristow Gallery has been a gallery for 25 years. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, uh, little known fact. Um, so we just had our 20, the 25-year anniversary. Um, uh, and it was... Like any good idea set up, but one of the head of the gallery, he's an artist, so as well as being a lawyer, and coming up with, like, we know lots of artists, they need some space. It was that very grassroots initiative. Um, and liking that idea and then supporting it and actually then sort of later on making a proper purpose-built spaces, you know, that we have. So we have a kind of, I suppose, a public gallery space, but the gallery also extends into the meeting rooms, so this... Um, seven meeting rooms that lead off the sort of public space and then that's also curated um i mean what it is brilliant is that it's there to support the arts it's there to support the artists and part of that's having a curated program where a curator looks after you and uh, you know does all the things and comes up with the ideas um and i really love working there i am 
I knew it long before I got the job there and I knew the previous curators, uh, Dave Bookman, and I loved the space. I wanted to show him the space. It was one of those things. And um, then the job came up and I said, like, oh my God, I've got a spot. I had a guest spot, um, which was super exciting. And um, I, what, what I really love about the fact that it is a building within a law firm is that I use the law and the context in which to curate. So it's not just like I've got a painting show that's about landscapes. It's like my first show is about what's called complicity. Um, so I'm thinking about what people are doing in that building, how they're operating, as well as the people that come in and might be there with some sort of problem, conflict, resolution that they need. Uh, they might be telling tales, which is another show that I had, and that was very okay. much about. So you, once you kind of have that context, it's a bit like anything. Like when you have your artwork and you know where your what your medium and your ideas are, sort of gives you a really rich vein. So the next show is called Rules of Freedom, and I'm thinking about the People's Representation Act, which allowed women and working men the public vote. And so the work is very, it's quite a politically themed show, but it's also very, it's about rule makers and rule breakers. And then also that kind of kicks into this being a law firm. Mm. So I really think about those links and narratives and, you know, I find it very exciting that people really use that space as well. So they're essentially site-specific shows. Yeah, mm. yeah. And Is there any kind of kickback from that? Do, do they, does the law firm try and influence would they would they say no you can't do this or anything that might critique them would you or or things that they work on no they're super super um supportive it's super, they're super engaged they're super enthusiastic they're super proud and since i've been there it's been just like this is great carry on in fact the more political you get the better hmm. <laughs> you know in a way Fantastic. <laughs> you know i was sort of you know um i they're really open and they're they're sort of art you know they're interested in the arts a lot of them are sort of members of boards of different art committees or you know patrons of things um and they're excited by by what i present so they don't say no i mean i the only thing that might get a no is if it was overtly pornographic which i'm not mm. going to put in a law firm because that yeah. would be a ridiculous context so I'm aware of the audience, but I also want them to be a bit tickled by it themselves. Yeah. Or a bit challenged, maybe. Yeah, because they're the sort of first audience in a way. Mm. They're there all the time. Mm. Um, and we can come and enjoy it as a theme show. But yeah, I, I really love it. And it's given me the freedom to um, kind of focus more on it. You know, it is, it is a freelance job. Um, I don't have to go into the offices unless it's for meetings or things I've mm. arranged. So it's given me a lot of freedom you know and I, I really appreciate that um, yeah and there's you know there's a budget that I can help artists with certain aspects of developing work if they need to for site specific projects or you know helping with transport all the things mm. that artists usually have to pay for yeah. themselves you know as much as possible you know um, and every time we sell something it goes back into the gallery pot so that's been good <laughs> you know, not have to pay for building or rent, or, you know, all those things, those small things when you're running it as well, like an artist-led space, you're like, we need bubble wrap, but that's 70 pounds, where are we going to get it? And I can be like, well, we need bubble wrap, you know. I mean, I'm not saying it's infinite budget, but it is very helpful to not have to worry about the small stuff, like, you know, that I used to when I was running an arts organisation with, like, pretty much nothing, um, and trying to make money from open calls to support the rest of the programme. So, mm. yeah. I think you were in a show there a few years ago. Um, at Colin Bristow? I think so. You, was it the one? Was it Liza and Lucy? Was it Face Values? Mm, no, it was, was a huge group show. Is it the place that has. So I don't think I've ever been. No, you have to come. Is it, <laughs> do you have like a permanent Damien Hurst on the wall and a permanent Gary Hume? No, no I don't oh, think it's the same place. place. Ah, so we have an lot. evolving programme, so we don't have a collection, so to ah, speak. Okay. There is a it, small collection, but we don't. That's not, I actually can't remember. Is that Clyde and Co? It was right in, uh, it's near uh, Barbican. Yeah. A, uh, uh, it's a law, f yeah, so it was the basement of a law firm. Linklaters, they have mm, a collection. No, it was, it has like, um, oh, upstairs. Oh, Simmons big, and Simmons. Yes, Simmons oh, and Simmons, yeah. 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 So, yeah. See, I know all about them, films and all. I've been to see them all, yeah. Is there animosity between the no, no, they, law firm galleries? No, they have a collection, you see, so they invest yeah. in the work in a different way. Mm. Um, you know, they kind of made a great decision about buying Peter Doig many years ago that they recently sold, and 
it's more an investment for them. I mean, obviously it's great yeah. that they're supporting artists, but mm. the thing is that you don't have an evolving programme, so then you have this, for the art, for the lawyers, for example, they've got the same artwork, and they do mm. change it around, I know that. The same artwork in the same room, and I sort of like them having a little change every three months or four months, and being like, oh, what's in this room today? Mm. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's good. It's good. It's needed, these alternative spaces that can support mm. the arts. You know, and other people have become a bit inspired by that, I think. So it's the works the work seen by people who it's kind of seen almost forcefully. Pe- people who wouldn't necessarily go into a gallery, they go into yeah, that, such and such a space. And... Yeah, that is part of it, definitely. But also they'll spend more time looking at it than they, mm. they did in the gallery, especially mm. if, like you know, in the meeting rooms where there is a the curated part of the show, um, they'll be sitting and looking at that for an hour, half an hour, which is more than most people do. Um, so I think that's always a nice benefit as well to it. And yeah, they are a bit forced to, but, you know, I had um, the first show I did there, that whole site-specific thing is I had a room for um, divorce <laughs> and infidelity. <laughs> 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 Subtle, intellectually, you know, wise, but it was kind of warring couples. So there was like a Mel Brumfield painting of Frida and Diego and just being like, this is the, and so I was like saying to them, I, I do talk for the staff before the show opens can come if you'd like and um i was saying so i'd really if you if you could there was a you know there was a room for extradition there was a room for copyright i was like if you could like plan your meetings to be in those specific <laughs> rooms yeah. but yeah i'm not sure <laughs> you know there's so the next show there's going to be a room of, of war and peace um in rules of freedom and nice. so that's going to be it's going to be another room that's sort of uh about kind of mental health issues and freedom of, and the emancipation of being able to kind of talk about these things more directly now. But yeah, so I kind of like that. That's great. <laughs> it's a good thing to riff with, you know? How important do you think it is to seek out critique and give critique and get critique? Because I think once you leave art school, there's no real kind of mm. formal critique anymore unless you actively seek it out. Uh, I think it's really important. Um, I think uh, that was something that I really found apparent when I left for college obviously you kind of suddenly have no one inputting and gradually over time like um, seeking a kind of critical context of crit- you know um, and peer groups and so it's a fairly regular part of my practice I mean my partner he's an artist so we kind of critique it's not a formal critique but we do look at each other's work and talk about it and I think that's really healthy um what might be working what not um but I have a very um kind of active I guess peer crit- crits in a way but informal you know I'm visiting people's studios they're visiting mine but I'm also part of um a group called the Undead Painters which was uh which is run by uh, Alistair Gordon and James Petrucci and we meet maybe now like once a year bring and work, talk about it. Um, I mean, again, there's like quite a few of us, so it's not like I'm sitting in now mm. in the studio, but it is still interesting to see how people react. Um, but yeah, it will be, you know, friends, friends of mine who I met through and called Sasha Bowles, who's a good friend of mine now, it will be like, in a way, there'll be an informal critique even on social media of like, yeah, that's interesting, that's not. And I have um, mentors as well, in a way, um, when I was at Royal College of Art, uh, the professor of painting taught me, and I've maintained contact with him. Again, he's become a good friend, which is like, well, added bonus. This is like mm-hmm. the most amazing painter. Um, but you know, if I send him work, he'll talk to me about it. Mm-hmm. You know, not in a sort of sit down one to one for an hour, but also I think earlier on in my career, I did I did have more of those sorts of things, and less so now because it's much more conversational. But I think. You know, one of the things I do is mentor, and it's really important that um, people do have that concentrated time with someone. And then I used to run lots of tutorials where people go and see other artists, and I'm really keen to encourage artists to do that themselves, to go and learn from somebody more experienced, to go and learn from others. Um, It's sort of the lifeblood of an artist, really, um, to keep those conversations going and the work developing and I think you know from time to time you know you might just meet one painter or something and have a painting tutorial once a year for an hour and you give them some money or whatever um Graham used to tutor me and he'd you know an hour of him was 
you know, be off on for six months going, oh my God, all these different thoughts and connections and things I need to read and, and so on. Um, but yeah, and if a lot, if there isn't one around, set your own one up, you know. Again, who do you want to learn from? Who do you want to maybe have a collective with? Who can you rely on? Who's going to turn up? You know, it's one of the things that I encourage um, because it's so, so important. I think it's been very easy. I don't want to keep banging on about social media, but it's, been, <laughs> it's become very easy to kind of get validation, to put a work up, people like it, and you think, great. That's, mm, right. that's problematic. Yeah, mm. but then then the, it seems like, or at least since I left art school, there's no real kind of honest critique anymore. Mm. I mean, it's very easy for people to say this is great, but nobody really critiques anything in a, in a kind of honest and open way which is kind of free of um free of uh what's the word offense i suppose mm. well i think yeah i wouldn't look to social media for critiquing i mean mm. you know we've all been on it why is this person more successful than that and mm. people liking things and it's also a danger i think as well with younger artists um that that is where they see their validation whereas their validation should be within a critical forum of artists and that you know that those artists are liking and commenting that there is some sort of serious back channel to that you mm-hmm. know and I think one of the things that I've kind of found tricky is that younger artists that have had a lot of exposure on social media from say whilst they're at college is that they're thinking that their work is great because a group of people out there somewhere who knows who they are say we love this or want this you know and I think sort of my thing is that, you know, that's great, you know, really great if people out there like it, but actually you engage with its progressiveness yourself and what it actually means, or are you just like sort of somehow gotten into the cycle of repetitive posting about things yeah. and what does it really mean? You know, again, somebody like Ollie, I'm on a mentoring programme with him, he gets loads of people liking it, but he's very interested in sort of your critical input you know over and above whether you like it and we've you know he's somebody that I mentor through a program um you know and uh not that he particularly needs it he's so great um but it's nice that somebody's given that opportunity he's part of this mentoring course so I get to talk to him about that as well even though I would anyway you know Mm. but that actually what you know what's working with the work or you know and you don't just kind of go into the liking commenting yeah thing yeah I think people of our age group Mm. or maybe like one or two years either side are the last kind of generation who didn't grow up with it yeah Mm. because (laughs) I didn't have like social media till I was maybe 18 yeah or 19 yeah so we kind of know what it's like before it yeah yeah yeah. but it's like a MySpace before but Lost, lost, yeah, sorry, very sorry different, different <laughs> wasn't it? <laughs> but it's Hello, like... MySpace people. <laughs> yeah. If I said that lecture now, they're like, "What?" It's like, what's that? Say, "Yeah." Now it's probably yeah. a good time to say you can find us find us on MySpace, uh, Bebo, uh, all the other. Yeah. Hit us up on MSN. <laughs> <laughs> but so it's for me, it's almost like a different language, and I find it really hard. Like, mm. I'm, I'm constantly feeling like I'm terrible at it. And, and like, I need to keep up with what, yeah. I, what I see as being the kids. Yeah, they're only like <laughs> three or four years younger than me. But that's because I, I didn't have it until I was essentially an adult. But, um, no, I mean, I didn't have like an email till I was about 18. Mm. You know, like, um, it is very different. And I, you but it's know, so effortless I, to some people. Oh, yeah, but they've grown up with it. Exactly. Um, mm. You know, it's, it's kind of supernatural. In a way, that doesn't mean they're necessarily good at it though, at the same time, I'll just say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so there can be a little bit too much, uh, you know, selfies and so on. But um, I think, you know, if I had had social media back when I was at Royal College, I would have been like on that way, you know, because I was trying to be on the whole, you know, mail outs and at that time it was Facebook only really. But, you know, I, it, it could have been quite different in a way of being able to build up that thing. But I think, again, you know, Real life is also important and talking to real people and having conversations, but being open and not just thinking, oh, our work is really good because you've got so many likes. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a really dangerous avenue to go down. Yeah. And I've had it a couple of times with younger artists, you know, that, that is how they validate themselves. Yeah, and then they start producing more work that's the more popular on their feed and then yeah, that yeah. sort of yeah. feeds into their practice. Who, and... yeah, what's, yeah, that's really dangerous. Mm. 
you know, it's great to be able to have feedback, but not if it directs your work in a way that is just about the superficial or the, you know, the, the, uh, you see, I think it's maybe the wrong kind of feedback because it's only ever positive. It's only ever someone will just double tap an image and like it. No one will ever, no one will ever comment and say, oh, it's a little bit lacking in this. <laughs> no. <laughs> so it's like a constant stream of validation without yeah. anything else. I think it's quite hard. Really. Yeah. yeah, it can be. I mean, I know what you mean. No one is going to, I mean, no one should either, in my mind, in a mm. public forum, criticise people. I find that. Yeah, yeah. Unre- I don't unrequested, do that. yeah. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. No, so I think it's that's a thing of why you need to have the conversations outside of that forum, mm. really. Um, but yeah, no one, you won't get a critical kind of thing. You just get, you know, emojis and stuff. And I'm also equally like, I'm not going to crit somebody's work on no. yeah. Instagram or, uh, you know, I might say, oh, I love that. If I don't love it, I won't say anything. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like, well, mm. yeah, but it is, a, you know, there, it, we, as we say, there are problems around that. Yeah. And I, I wonder what it will be like in the future. <laughs> I suppose it depends, it depends how the platforms change, doesn't yeah. it, as well? How Instagram, I'm sure, will go down the route of Facebook, as it's owned by Facebook, mm-hmm. of, of the algorithm showing less work and the organic reach going down and ending up with lots of paid content. And yeah. then that will completely change things. But then maybe some some new startup will yeah, come in and ex- replicate exactly. what Instagram is doing. In the yeah, game. exactly. They could, they'll just be a replacement, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. It's hard not to get caught up in it, though, because it is such an incredible... Like, I don't want to keep just saying how terrible it is, but it's so, <laughs> it's so incredible, and that's how probably more work through Get things soon. like Instagram and Facebook than I yeah. do through galleries. Um, we we don't pay for any... We don't have a marketing team or a, any no. of this. We do a show. We curate a show, and then we just stick it up on Facebook, do a few posts yeah, about on Instagram, come. and people come. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's, I mean, yeah, it's, it's fantastic how to tool, reach those people. Yeah. You know, we, do, we have the same... Um, but yeah, it's great for that marketing element, but it's maybe not, you know, it's also really hard on the other side, you know, if you post up why somebody has liked one thing more than another, and mm. like, but I don't question that too much because it could be something really like time of day or, you know, something else was going on or whatever it is, but, um, it's a real science There's like all these different mitigating factors that, mm almost like kind of un, un, uh, measurable. Yeah, I mean, it, and it is tricky because it's another thing to do. Like I have to spend quite a lot of time doing not just the gallery, but also my account. <laughs> and we've got two Twitter accounts and, you know, um, then I help out with other people sometime or whatever it mm. is. And there is a constant thing. You have to be doing it. Um, yeah, which is both good and bad. Um, it's I'm glad it's there I suppose more than I'm sort of find it something and it's great when it it leads to something you know along the line and brings people together I think that's the ultimate thing 